Welcome to another episode of Graphic Man. Today we're going to be talking about Gold Key Comics. Gold Key Comics are basically the comics produced by Western Publishing. They also produced identical comics under a different logo called Whitman. But every Gold Key comic is identical to their Whitman variant, except for the logo. So why would Gold Key publish the same kinds of books under the Whitman logo as well? Because comics that were placed on the newsstands could be returned to the publisher if they didn't sell and the newsstand could get their money back. For example, here's a comic with its title torn off. The newsstand dealer would tear off the titles of books that didn't sell and they would send the titles, not the whole comic, into the publisher for credit. Then it was up to the newsstand dealer to dispose of the damaged comic book, although many people would dig these wounded comics out of the trash and sell them to their friends for a huge discount. But the Whitman books were sold in toy stores and airports and special places not with the newsstand comics. So they didn't offer a refund if someone turned in a Whitman logo. It had to be a gold key. So now that I've given you the most basic of introductions, I'd like to show you some gold key comics with the occasional Whitman variant. Up first is this nice Korak son of Tarzan. We start off with Korak number three. This is from May 1964. The first few issues of Korak had their painted cover also printed as a back cover pinup art and the interior work was drawn by Russ Manning. Here's Korak number five from October of 1964. It's in rough condition, but that's okay with me. I provide a home for these poor, neglected Gold Key comics. Here's the back cover. He's being attacked by man-eating plants. And more Russ Manning artwork on the inside. Here's Korak number six. From March of 1965. I didn't mention the artist that did the painted covers earlier because I wasn't sure. But this one is by Morris Gollop. And here's the back cover. Here's Korak number 9 from July of 1965 with another great painted cover by Morris Golub, which makes me wonder if I shouldn't just turn the books around in their Mylar bags and display the back covers instead of the front. Here's Korak number 10 from September of 1965 painted cover by Morris Golub. And I want to show you an interior piece of artwork by Mike Arans, or A E, excuse me, A R E N S. Mike Arans. If you are looking for a good picture of elephants to practice your drawing skills, then be sure to rewind the video later and get out your pencils. Even that drawing of the tree looks pretty good. Here's Korak number 13 from June of 1965. This painted cover is by George Wilson. And sadly, there weren't any more pinup back covers at this point, but the advertisements were sometimes neat to look at. Here's a Cheerios ad starring Rocky and Bullwinkle, and a Polaris nuclear sub advertisement. And at the bottom, it shows you a list of other gold key comics that you could buy, like Bonanza, The Man from Uncle, or The Munsters. Here's Korak number 14 from September of 1966. Painted cover by George Wilson. Here's Korak number 15 from December of 1965. Painted cover also by George Wilson. On the back cover, kids would sell Christmas cards and earn money to get prizes like a movie projector, a tape recorder, bow and arrow, and radios. Here's Korak number 17, oh, excuse me, number 16. March 1967 with a painted cover by George Wilson. Here's Korak number 18 from August 1967 painted cover by George Wilson. Here's Korak number 20 from December of 1967 painted cover by George Wilson and here's a scan of the original art for that cover. Here's Korak number 23 from June 1968. 
for the painted cover by George Wilson. The ads in this book were for more Gold Key comics. You could be getting Yogi Bear, Little Lulu, Secret Squirrel, Laurel and Hardy and the Jetsons. It also had sheet music. So if you wanted to take this song over to the piano and sing the little song, there was also an advertisement for smaller digest sized books. These were great little books to have when your parents would drive you across the country and expect you to get excited at the scenery of the California Redwoods or the Grand Canyon when all you wanted was some small little comic books to read in the back seat. Here's Korak number 25. October of 1968, painted cover by George Wilson. Here's Korak number 28 from April 1969 with a painted cover by George Wilson. This issue has an advertisement for you to grow miniature trees. Here's Korak number 29, June of 1969, painted cover by George Wilson. This issue has an advertisement for fluorescent posters. I'd want the Huckleberry Hound and Fred Flintstone poster. Here's Korak number 32. From December of 1969, the painted cover by George Wilson. This issue has another ad for little comic digest books. And this time they want you to play with your matchbox cars on the kitchen table. While the back cover told you to get the Hot Wheels racetrack. Here's some interior artwork by Dan Spiegel. Here's Korak number 34 from April of 1970. It's a painted cover by George Wilson. This issue has a Kellogg's advertisement of Dick Dastardly. Here's Korak number 37 from September of 1970 covered by George Wilson. This issue has an ad for some great barnyard animals, but unfortunately, they made the cow look extremely stupid. I had these as a kid, but you've got to get rid of the cow and keep the rest. It also had a Daisy Air Rifle ad. Here's Korak number 38, November 1970, painted cover by George Wilson. This issue has a gyro-powered car that you can race. Korak number 39, January 1971. Painted cover by George Wilson, and this issue had a Flintstones vitamin stuffed toy you could get. I grew up on Flintstones vitamins, but they weren't offering this toy when I was starting to pay attention to things. And I wouldn't have liked the commercial proudly displayed right on Fred's shirt. Here's Korak number 42 from July 1971, covered by George Wilson. This issue had another gyro-powered car from Kenner Advertisements. Here's Korak number 44, November 1971, painted by George Wilson. This issue has another gyro-powered car from Kenner Plus a monster advertisement for either Frankenstein or Boney the Skeleton. And when you clip the coupon, it's shaped like a coffin. And after coupons shaped like coffins, you need some Andy Panda. And so here's issue number five from August of 1974. Here's some interior artwork. Andy Panda number six from November of 1974. Andy Panda number 10 from November of 1975. This issue contains a Hostess fruit pie advertisement and a coupon advertisement of some nice reprint material from decades past. If you remember the bookcase tour, I did. I've already showed you the Uncle Scrooge book. And now some Magnus, Robot Fighter. This is number 23 from August 1968. This painted cover is from Dan Spiegel. Here's number 24, November 1968. I can't find any information on who painted this cover, but my goodness, 
Isn't it amazing? Here's Magnus number 40 from August 1975. Painted cover by Vic Prezio, P-R-E-Z-I-O. And the interior artwork is by Russ Manning. Magnus number 42 from January 1976 with painted cover by Vic Prezio. This issue has a motorcycle stunt toy advertisement, a great hostess cupcakes ad starring Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig, and a Kenner Six Million Dollar Man action figure. It was a great time to be alive. The Occult Files of Dr. Spectre number 19 from April of 1976, and the original art for the painted cover by Jesse Santos. This one's a Whitman variant. It's Turok, Son of Stone, number 128. By this time in 1981, there were no more newsstand editions of Gold Key, so all you had available was the Whitman brand. Front cover here by George Wilson. Here's some interior artwork by Rex Maxson. Bullwinkle, number three. From April of 1972, the cover artist is Al Kilgore. This issue contains a double page ad for Joe Namath, the electric football game with a full color stadium. And here's some interior artwork showing Mr. Peabody, also by Al Kilgore. Here's Chip and Dale, number 48 from September of 1977. Cover artwork by Harvey Eisenberg. This issue contains a hostess fruit pie ad starring Sad Sack. And here's page one interior artwork, guest starring Donald Duck. Artwork by Phil DeLara. Donald Duck number 109 from September of 1966. Front cover by Tony Strobel. Donald Duck number 119 from May of 1968. Guest starring Captain Hook. This issue has an advertisement for Golden Magazine, which was a children's magazine. Donald Duck number 120 from July of 1968 front cover by Tony Strobel. Donald saves the entire planet in this issue but of course nobody knows about it. Donald Duck 122 from November of 1968 cover by Tony Strobel. This issue had a Matchbox toy car driver's license you could get. Now keep in mind this book is on the stands in November of 1968. And as we can look at the fine print, once you do get this license, it will expire next July. Donald Duck 123 from January 1969. Another Tony Strobel cover. Inside is an ad for General Electric. Here's Junior Woodchucks number six from July of 1970. Junior Woodchucks number eight from January of 1971. This issue had an Easy Curl styling kit advertisement. This kit had an electric light bulb for the makeup mirror and it even warmed up some rollers for you to curl your hair. There's Huey Dewey Louie Junior Woodchucks number 10 from July of 1971. Inside is a Sugar Daddy candy ad giving away cards with painted portraits of animals. From what I can see they look really good. Junior Woodchucks number 12 this is a great cover. In January 1972 with a scary giant dog. Looks like the boys will need the help of Pluto to solve this mystery. Using a tranquilizer dart gun for some reason the senior citizen Uncle Scrooge is the one holding the gun instead of the crack shots like the Junior Woodchucks themselves. Of course the dog attacks them and sure enough Uncle Scrooge misses the target. Looks like it's up to Pluto, after all, to save the day. 
This issue has an easy bake oven of sweepstakes that you can enter and you can win an actual real working oven for your mom and a dingo boot advertisement with guest star Joe Namath who couldn't wait to meet the kid who tripped somebody up trying to steal Joe's car. Junior Woodchuck's number 15 from July of 1972. Here's issue number 17 from November of 1972. And the advertisement is another monster ad, but this time it has a vampire bat. Junior Woodchuck's number 18 from January of 1973. And here's one I highly recommend you get. Junior Woodchuck's number 22 from September of 1973. It contains a reprint of a Carl Bark story from Walt Disney Comics number 282 called The Bubble Weight Champ. Duckburg's Junior Woodchucks are competing with a rival group of Woodchucks from Goose Town and they are so evenly matched that it has fallen to their instructors to battle each other to see which outpost will win the contest. Unfortunately, the Duckburg outpost instructor is out sick with chickenpox, and that means that they will have to use their substitute instructor, Donald Duck. So the boys go on a wild chase to find Donald, and they find him drinking way too much gurgle up soda pop. They inform Donald that he will have to be in a boxing match with the other outpost commander. Donald is of course sure that he can handle any boxing match, but he's so bloated from drinking soda pop that he ends up punching himself out. Just then a woman announces that her child has fallen into a bear pit at the zoo and Donald revives and declares that he will save the child, but as he approaches the bear pit he doesn't have the strength to walk through a spider's web. But look who shows up to save the day. It's the rival Junior Woodchucks instructor from Goose Town. And he walks through a brick wall. And his name is Bold and True. The short Goose Town instructor disposes of the bear very effortlessly. The zookeepers wonder how they're going to lift that heavy child out of the bear pit. But Bold and True leaps out of the pit carrying the child on one finger. Of course the boys pass out when they realize that their Uncle Donald doesn't have a chance in a boxing match against the Goose Town instructor. But Donald still tries quickly to get loosened up for the big boxing match later that night. But all he can think about is his gurgle up soda pop. While the Goose Town champ prepares for the fight by skipping rope with a heavy chain and chewing on the roots of a tree. He confidently declares that he only drinks yak's milk as his secret weapon. At the big boxing match, the Goose Town instructor is ready for the fight, while Donald is still asking for gurgle up soda pop. The boys decide to go ahead and let him have a soda, just as the Goose Town boys are bringing in some yak's milk for their champ, but glass bottles aren't allowed in the arena. But both drinks are allowed in if they are poured into paper cups. And it looks as if, in the confusion, each woodchuck reaches for the wrong paper cup. Each drink is delivered and both Donald and Bold and True react differently to their beverages. Bold and True, especially being a health nut, cannot handle drinking soda pop. So both boxers are sluggish. But Donald manages to deliver his looping right hook and down goes Bold and True. So the Duckburg Troop of Junior Woodchucks win another medal. All thanks to gurgle up soda pot. Now here's Junior Woodchucks number 40 from September of 1976. It has a Hostess Twinkies ad starring the Incredible Hulk. Junior Woodchucks number 57 from July of 1979. This issue has a Star Trek motion picture ad on the back cover and a Dynabrite comics ad for some great comics printed on thick paper and a heavy cover stock plus a full page ad for Happy Days comics based on the TV show. Junior Woodchucks number 60 from December of 1979. I hope Donald packed some food because it doesn't look like the boys brought much of anything. 
I've already shown the Dr. Solar comics way back in my first episode, so don't forget to go back and see that video if you missed it. Here's Walt Disney Showcase number 17. With Dick Van Dyke and Julie Andrews on the cover. Showcase, or Walt Disney Showcase number 38 from April of 1977. I never understood why Disney turned Mickey Mouse, who was a great detective back in the 30s, into this sidekick for this weird Sherlock Holmes imitation. So let's look at some better Mickey Mouse artwork. Here's a Mickey Mouse issue number 92 from February of 1964. On the back cover, you can get 204 Revolutionary War soldiers, which includes 12 cannons and even some Mohawk Indians. Here's page one. It also had some ads, primarily this one for Turok and Tarzan. And from time to time, Gold Key tried to be educational, showing you these great drawings of animals and including some information about them. Mickey Mouse number 106 from April of 1966 with a great shark cover. It has a very funny inside the front cover gag that I'm sure the Disney Corporation of today would probably faint if they knew it existed. Mickey Mouse number 117 from May of 1968. Here's number 147 from February 1974. It has a Viewmaster ad mentioning the Partridge family, Casper and Snoopy and a Daisy Air Rifle ad that tells boys that if they leave their bicycle in the driveway, their parents aren't going to think they can handle the responsibility of having an air rifle. And they're probably correct. Here's Mickey Mouse. Number 163 from June of 1976. And if he's not taking on the Sheriff of Nottingham, He's taking on these Vikings. It's Mickey Mouse 165 from August of 1976. And the advertisement is for personality posters. I'm not sure what personality you were supposed to get from Raquel Welch, but I really wanted the two posters that were near the bottom of this ad. The Creature from the Black Lagoon and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Mickey Mouse number 169, February of 1977, had an ad for real tools for children, including sharp saws, screwdrivers, hammers, you name it. I had one of these, and although I didn't build a birdhouse like the boy in this ad, I did make a stereo speaker cabinet, which totally surprised my father, as he had other plans for that lumber. Here's Mickey Mouse, number 175, from September of 1977. I'm not sure what Morty and Ferdy are standing on as they peer around the corner, but they sure are checking out that title and are very amused with the lettering. Inside this issue is a coupon for Icy that I used to get at our gas station. Then a Starstream half-page ad for science fiction books carrying the Whitman logo. Later on, you get a full page ad for Starstream, and on the alternate facing page was an ad for all kinds of Star Trek posters and pins. Here's Mickey Mouse number 187 from September of 1978. Here's page one. I would love a little houseboat automobile like that, although I don't know if it's legal on the highways. Inside is a Captain America Hostess Twinkies snack advertisement and an ad for something called Flip It, which I suppose is guaranteed to land on its feet. Even Frankenstein wanted in on the action. It's too bad nobody thought to include Gorgon from the Inhumans. His feet would have been perfect. Mickey Mouse 179 from September 1979 
has an ad for Snippies, the cartoon scissors. And if you order two of them, you save money. I think I had Daffy Duck and Woody Woodpecker. Then there was an ad for walkie-talkies that look like bananas. Yes, kids, there's a big science fiction movie in theaters right about now. And science fiction programming is on television. It's never been bigger. So to make sure the idea of you buying a banana-shaped walkie-talkie appeals to you, no pun intended, we want you to think about outer space when you use the banana walking talkie. And speaking of science fiction, here's a full page ad for Buck Rogers Comics. And just in case anyone had any confusion about what was the difference between Gold Key and Whitman, they basically tell you that you can read Buck Rogers in Gold Key, or if they come in a bag with two other comics, then they were Whitman. Mickey Mouse number 200, the big 200 issue from October 1979. This issue had an ad for Battle of the Planets. And this artwork right here is almost what the cover for the first issue would look like. And a Hostess Twinkies ad starring Captain Marvel. The real one. I had two of those. Here's Mickey Mouse number 201 from November of 1979. Here Goofy has discovered that plumbers get paid by the hour. This issue has a host of Swinkies ad starring the Human Torch, coming just one year after he was replaced by that Herbie the Robot in the Saturday morning cartoon. I blame Star Wars for this, as some TV execs probably thought the kids would rather see a robot that's short and white like R2-D2. They were wrong. It also had an ABC television ad for the Saturday cartoon lineup. Nothing real spectacular here, but they did introduce Spider-Woman from Marvel Comics. And they did that to counter what CBS was getting ready to do. CBS had a centerfold ad for their cartoon lineup, of which I faithfully watched Tarzan, but CBS gave us Web Woman. Web Woman only lasted 10 episodes, and there was no action figures or toys related to the, uh, the cartoon. So. It just didn't last. Before the 1970s television show, Gold Key had one issue of Buck Rogers in October of 1964 with a painted cover. And they reproduced the cover on the back without the title words or logo. Star Trek number 50 cover art is attributed to George Wilson. It's too bad about that barcode on the bottom left, but I found this scan from an auction website for the original artwork. Star Trek number 50 was released in January of 1978. The Phantom Block number 5 from April of 1966. Guest starring Donald and Mickey. Here's the back cover. It took the entire issue for Mickey and Donald to get the block in jail, but the inside cover gags show that Grandma Duck has no problem administering justice. And the other inside cover gag shows Pluto having no trouble getting the blot right back in jail. And speaking of the Phantom, Porky Pig faced off against a Phantom-like character in Porky Pig number 5, March of 1966. This Phantom that terrorized the Wild West tried to hypnotize Sylvester into attacking Porky. On the back cover, young Cicero is innocently reading comic books when Porky decides to give him a birthday present of a chemistry set. And Cicero nearly blows up the entire house, which proves the point that Gold Key comics are better than chemistry. Here's Porky Pig, number 38 from October of 1971. This issue has a backup story of Cool Cat, which I rarely ever got to see. Here's Porky Pig number 47 from February of 1973. Porky's not very observant, is he? Here's Boris Karloff number 34 from April of 1971. Front cover is believed to be George Wilson. And here's a scan of the original art. Super Goof number 11 from June of 1969. 
Super Goof number 25 from June of 1973. Here's number 46 from April of 1978. Here's number 48 from August 1978. And this issue had a full page ad for UFO, Backdoor Fiction. Speaking of which, here's UFO Flying Saucers number 11, cover art by George Wilson. And here's the original art for that cover, August of 1976. UFO in Outer Space number 23, October 1979, painted by Art Saaf, S-A-A-F. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Here's the original artwork. Here's by Whitman, Super Goof, number 65 from 1981. Number 66 from December of 1981. Here's Tweety and Sylvester, number 13 from February of 1970. I don't know if Gratu Orloff is watching, but here's Sylvester, number 31. Tweety and Sylvester, number 31. He might like this one. From July of 1973, this issue has a parody of a monster movie being directed by Alfred Hitchcock, but instead they call him Alf White Hitchcock. Sylvester is playing the part of a vampire cat who will attack Tweety Bird. But when the clock strikes midnight, Sylvester cannot control himself and Tweety cries out for Gregor, which is a cross between Igor and Frankenstein, who grabs Sylvester and puts a stop to the attack. Tweety Bird is impressed with the big acting ability of Sylvester and this movie would be 10 times better than anything Hollywood has put out lately. Here's Uncle Scrooge 112 from June of 1974. This book will be hard to get in the future. It's drawn by Carl Barks, but since it depicts Indians, there are groups of people that don't want this book to be shown, let alone exist. Barks is in his usual good form with many wild animals. And Donald gets to look quite heroic as a sturgeon swallows him. But Donald is too much for him. I always like it when Donald gets to look confident. Here's Uncle Scrooge number 69. From May 1967. Great helicopter issue. Uncle Scrooge 99. From June of 1972, it contains a Daisy Air Rifle advertisement and a Johnny Bench Magnetic Baseball Game ad. Here's Walt Disney Comics number 265 from October of 1962. And here's the back cover. Inside is a story by Carl Barks where Donald has to imitate Magicka Dispel. Here's Walt Disney Comics and Stories, number 280. It contains a Karl Bark story. Donald disguises himself as Uncle Scrooge to avoid dealing with certain people, while Scrooge also decides to disguise himself as Donald to avoid dealing with problems. And neither of them know what the other is up to. Here's Walt Disney Comics and Stories, number 359. From August of 1970. This book still contains the poster inside. I wanted to see what the poster would look like, but I didn't want to take it out of the book. And the way it's stapled in the centerfold, it allowed me to scan all four sides to it. And then I tried to put those four scans together to get this image of what it would look like. And it had this old ad for sea monkeys. Pink Panther, number 57, from October of 1978. This book had another centerfold advertisement for CBS television cartoons, and this time they had a better drawing of Web Woman, but it still only lasted about 10 episodes. And of course, we only just 
skim the surface of Gold Key Whitman and how they came out of Dell Comics and they avoided using the Comics Code. There's many, many things I could show you and talk about. We didn't even get to half the titles they did, Flash Gordon, Grimm's Ghost Stories, things like that. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, as always, happy drawing. We'll see you next time.